Okay, I want to jump in. So with Easter approaching rapidly, um, we started a series called Risen. And the reason why we started this series is because the, the resurrection of Jesus is the most, it's not probably, it is the most significant event that has ever happened in world history. I mean, our, our date is set either before Christ or after Christ. Everything changed in world history with Jesus' life, specifically his death, burial, and resurrection. And to be clear, Jesus is returning. We know this to be true. But there's so much that took place in the resurrection of Jesus. It's more than the punchline to the Easter message on Sunday. I mean, it's, it's the scarlet thread all through the scripture and for the rest of our life. So I wanted to take some time and, and maybe begin to unpack what it means when we celebrate that Jesus is risen. What does that mean exactly? We all, we all celebrate it. We're, we're, we're all there on Easter Sunday. He is risen. But, but what does that mean for you personally today? What does that mean for you in this life that he's risen? Well, this is what we've been talking about. In week one, we talked about your identity is connected to the finished work of the cross. Last week, we talked about the fruit that God desires from you is made available through our union with him because of the finished work of the cross. And today, I want to talk to you about a word we don't use that much in our modern language, but it's a word called consecration. Everyone say consecration. That's a, that's a $10 word right there. That's a, that's a nice little church word. Consecration, what in the world is that? Well, the truth is, um, the Bible has a lot to say about this word consecration, and it is all directly connected to the finished work of the cross. And the truth is, if you don't understand this concept of consecration, and you will by the end of today, then you'll never really understand your significance in life. Your, your identity is tied into this, your calling, your significance as an individual and as a church body. It gives so much meaning to our existence. So we have to understand this in light of the finished work of the cross. So uh, it, it may feel a little heavy today, so I, I'm going to open up with a joke. I feel like that's wisdom to do. It's, it's going to go down easier. It's not going to be that bad, guys. It, I, I'm actually really encouraged about today's message. Uh, so a, a man and his wife and his mother-in-law take a vacation to Jerusalem. And while visiting the Holy Land, the mother-in-law passes away. So the man goes to the local uh, funeral home and he's trying to get some, you know, some instructions, some details. Man, what do I do in this situation? So the, the undertaker there tells him to ship your mother-in-law home for her funeral services will cost you $5,000. But if you do the services here in the Holy Land, it'll only cost you $150. So man thinks about it long and hard, and he says, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and ship her home for $5,000. And the undertaker says, why, why would you spend $5,000 to ship her home when you can just bury her here in, in the Holy Land in Jerusalem for $150? And the man tells him this. He says, you know, about 2,000 years ago, a man died here, and they buried him. And on the third day, he resurrected from the grave. And he said, mister, I just can't take that chance. <laughs> That's terrible. I know. That's rough. I know. And if you didn't laugh, I understand. If your mother-in-law is here with you, I, I get it. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I have an amazing mother-in-law and father-in-law. So yeah, that, jo that joke was not intended for her at all. Yeah. That's funny. But I want to talk to you about this word, consecration. Um, we, 
one of the things that we see, again, all through Scripture, is that God has always intended to have a people set apart for himself. And when we talk about this word consecration, that's exactly what it means, to be set apart. That's it. To consecrate means to be set apart. Set apart for what, you ask? Great question. Set apart for good works. Set apart for holiness. Set apart to be God's own possession. Um, you're, to be, you're to be in the in the culture and society of the world, but set apart from it. And God has always done this from the Old Testament all the way to the New. But what's interesting is we never had the ability to be fully set apart, to be fully consecrated until the finished work of the cross was accomplished. Jesus made a way through his death, burial, and resurrection so that he could truly have a people set apart for him. So when you think about this world, this word consecration, it simply means to be set apart. But you're set apart to a person. You're set apart for the Lord. And so we'll, we'll kind of get into this um, here in just a little bit. Uh, I want to give you a scripture that highlights this, and it's Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. And it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed, our blessed hope, the appearing of glory of our, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So that word purify for himself that we see in verse 14, that is consecration. It, it, it gives another, uh, some depth to what it means to be consecrated. God does two things through the finished work of the cross. Number one, he redeems us from all lawlessness and purifies you for himself, a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This is a perfect definition of consecration and what it looks like and what it means. But there is no consecration apart from Jesus and apart from the finished work of the cross. So again, as I was mentioning, that word consecration in the, in the Greek, it's the word kadesh, uh, and it means set apart for holy use. And, and we see this, again, all through the scriptures. So in the Old Testament, uh, the priests were set apart, right? They were anointed with oil, and they were set apart for their duty as priests. Uh, they would do the same thing for prophets. They would anoint them with oil, and they were set apart, consecrated, to be a prophet for the Lord. Kings were anointed, set apart, consecrated to, to lead as kings. Uh, we see this happening with those who were called to carry the Ark of the Covenant. They were set apart, consecrated for a certain work. Um, temples and homes were consecrated. They were set apart. Um, no unclean or unholy thing could come into the temple. Now, the Lord doesn't we don't set apart temples anymore, buildings per se, because we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus accomplished at the cross. He doesn't live in buildings made by human hands, but he only lives in buildings made by his hands. And you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've been consecrated now. You've been set apart for his dwelling. Um, Certain vessels, uh, dishes, were set apart for the king's service in the Old Testament. The seventh day, the Sabbath day, was consecrated or set apart unto the Lord. Certain offerings were given to God. They were set apart from the rest of your finances to give to the Lord. It was for a holy work. This is all through the scripture. This is God's way. It's always been his way. Uh, so I don't want you to think this is some new uh, catchy idea. No, this is, this is the way it is with our God. And then also people 
even nations are set apart for the Lord. God has always had a people in mind when it comes to consecration, but they're always to be a holy people, a set apart people. So it's always been his way. Now we're going to get into this, but before we talk about the purpose of consecration, there's three purposes I want to give you. Um, And before we get into those, I want to talk to you about what hinders our consecration. Because this is a very real thing, and we we need to understand it. Uh, Many of you know that our our modern church, um, and there's many statistics out there that I I won't bore you with, uh, but the church at large is suffering decline in its membership. Uh, There are less people attending church today than ever before. There are less people that claim to be Christians today than even 20 years ago. Um, So we're we're on a decline, and that's just happening. And I, I would also suggest to you that we're, not only are we in a spiritual decline, we're in a moral decline as a society, as a people Um, sin is more rampant now than it ever has been. Uh, There are things that we maybe held to a higher esteem even 10 to 15 years ago, and now it's just commonplace. It's just the the more the majority gets on board with some of these, these, uh, these sins, the more sin becomes trivial, no big deal, because everybody's doing it. And so we're on a moral decline as well. And... Um, I think it's interesting that when I read you uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, one of the things it mentions there, I'm going to read it to you again. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Here it is, verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Everyone say worldly passions. So this is all part of uh, sanctific- or sanctification, same, same, basically the same word as consecration to be set apart, there's something that hinders you being set apart. And it's, it's worldly ideas. It's, it's the spirit of this age. It, it, is in, it is in perfect contrast with the value system of God. And it's the, it's the reason why we're, we're in, a, in a decline. So what's worldliness? Here's a definition of worldliness. It's when the culture of the world has a greater influence over any other culture, in this case the church, so that the church begins to resemble the world and no longer God. This is is what worldliness is in a very simple definition. We are so indoctrinated with the ways of the world, we no longer look like God's chosen people. We just blend right in. It's worldliness. The Bible speaks extensively about guarding ourselves from this. But it fights against this purpose of God setting apart a people. So, so here's how this happens. This, uh, this compromise of the church, this compromise of God's people being set apart. It happens basically in, in three prominent ways. Uh, the first way is a compromise of Scripture. Um, our culture... Our society as a whole, we have compromised sound doctrine and the Word of God, right? This has become just really meaningless uh, to, to, to many people. And so when we don't trust the authority of the Bible, here's what happens. You begin to open yourself up to the father of lies. See, this word is truth. And if, if we don't believe truth, then you'll be deceived to believe something else as your truth. And you need to know something about your adversary is the Bible says he's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the accuser of the brethren, and he's the father of lies. Lying is his native tongue. This is what he does well. And he'll do it with a half-truth, half-lie. And I've told you this before, a half-truth is a whole lie. But this is what he does. So when we don't count this word as our final authority, you open yourself up to the deception and lies of Satan. It's what, this is what our world is going through right now. It's why we're in a, a spiritual and moral decline. 
Uh, the other reason is, and this is still part of compromising sound doctrine in Scripture, is that if we don't believe this is true, then we, we, will, also, we will also be duped in believing that there are, there are multiple roads to the Father. And this one's really prevalent right now. Um, the, and the Bible is clear that there is only one way to the Father, only through Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through Him. It is crystal clear. There is no other way, not through Buddha, not through Muhammad, not through any other religion. Only Jesus, only Jesus, and the finished work of the cross, the only way to the Father. I think it's interesting that, uh, like when you start reading in the New Testament, like in our Bible reading plan, we're in 1 Timothy right now. And I believe it's in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul sends Timothy into Ephesus. He sends them into this city basically to correct them and to correct their false doctrine. Like he's sending them in there with authority. He was like, man, they are, they are preaching another Jesus. They are preaching a false doctrine. And it is corrupting the entire society, but specifically the church. And so Timothy goes in there with authority and begins to teach and to preach and to encourage, uh, we also see it in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. It says, I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. This is what he tells them to do. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure, what? Sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. This is happening right now. The Bible, the Bible talks about in the last days, it will be like this. This is where we are right now. People don't want sound doctrine. They have itching ears. So they surround themselves with cheerleaders that just clap them and, and, you know, just cheer them on and just tell me everything I want to hear. Don't tell me what I need to hear. Don't correct me. You're not the boss of me, right? Just tell me what I want to hear. Tell me how good I am. Tell me how smart I am. And, and the Bible talks about in the last days, there'll be people that call good evil and evil good. Like, we've blurred the lines completely of morality. This, guys, this is where we're living. We live here right now. This is where we are. So you can see the relevance of this message. And as Easter is approaching, when we think about the finished work of the cross and Jesus rising on the third day, I want you to also remember that he did that for a people that he has set apart for himself, his own possession, a people consecrated by the shedding of his blood, that they are now washed clean and they are without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And they are in the world, but they are not of the world. Those are my people and they belong to me. This is what he did. This is what he did. And there's a reason for it. And I love it. I'm done with this chair. Come on, baby. That's one of the compromises, sound doctrine and scripture. Here's another compromise. And it, this fights against being set apart. This fights against God's plan. The second one is compromising kingdom values. Everyone say kingdom values. And understand that every society and every culture, every community is it's established by values. Look, in, in your home that you live in with your children, there's a value system in your home. Whether you've ever sat down with them and said, kids, this is our value system. If you've never done that, here's the thing. You don't have to. Your actions and your words dictate what your values are to those kids. Your actions and your words will tell them, will teach them, will communicate to them what is important to you and what is not important to you. Just your actions and your words alone. Everyone say values. So there's values in your home. 
There's a value system in every single home in America. And there's a value system in God's home, in God's kingdom with his people. And so this is part of having this this people set apart, is that we emulate our father. We reflect the image of our father to a world through a value system. And it looks completely different than the world. I don't want to rabbit trail on this because I'll get way off. But it's the reason why this scripture talks about, if if you want to read the value system, uh, read the Beatitudes, uh, starting in Matthew 5. Read chapter 5, 6, and 7. And Jesus is, is telling them, this is the way it is in the kingdom. Now that the kingdom has come. And he talks about blessing those who curse you. Oh, see, we don't do that. Pray for those, right, who wrong you. Now nah, we don't do that very well. The, the list goes on. He's saying this is what it looks like in the kingdom. If there was one that is really, really, really prevalent right now, it is, man, it is sexual immorality. Like it is, yeah, it's, it's the big one in our culture. The biggest one that I can see. So much so that uh, oftentimes the Bible will give us a list of, of sins to stay away from, but there's this one in particular almost every time makes every single list. Uh, let me read it to you. It's in first, here's one of the places. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with who? Sexually immoral people. Not all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But I am now writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or slanderer or drunker or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business of it is of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked, wicked person from among you. So again, this is, uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing this letter to the church in Corinth. And he's telling them not to associate with sexually immoral people. But he's saying, look, he's like, I'm not talking about the people in the world. They don't know any better. He goes, I'm not talking about them. He goes, I'm talking about the people in your church. I'm talking about the believers, the brothers and sisters in Christ, those, the ones that have been set apart for me, those ones, separate them from among you. Not in in a way that we're better than you, but... Uh, it's a way to purify, to keep the rest of the church from becoming corrupt. And so in other places, he, he talks about turning them over to Satan so that they can come to a place of repentance. And that's always God's heart is, is that people recognize they're living in sin and then they come back and they surrender that sin to the Lord. That's what he wants. So he doesn't want us, you know, walking around like goody two shoes. That's not it at all. But he's saying, man, this fellowship of believers, this church that I that cost the blood of my son, it's valuable and it means something. And so he, he's and he's fighting this off like cancer, like a plague, like a virus. But I think about like our own our modern culture and where we are today. Man, look, you, I don't care what radio station you listen to right now. I think every song is about sex. Every single song. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. There's all these little innuendos, and sometimes there's not innuendos at all. I mean, they're just blatantly saying it now. It's it's everything. It's sex before marriage. It's sleeping around. It's all this sexual promiscuity. It's just, it's all happening. It's everywhere. It's in every movie. It's in every book. It's in every novel. It's in every conversation. It's in every song. It's the message that's being preached in our society. This is just where we are. It's, It's just... It's just what's happening. It's a big deal. Thank you, Lord. I don't think I finished reading the rest of that scripture, but it's okay.
The third area that we see compromise, and this is still what's fighting against being set apart, is compromised leadership. Everyone say compromised leadership. Yep, so the first one was uh, compromising sound scripture and doctrine, the word of God. The second one was compromising kingdom values. And the third one is compromised leaders. Uh, We see this happening more and more and more. This is so prevalent in the church. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but it seems like every time you turn on the news or anytime you turn on a, a radio station, another church leader has fallen. Have you guys been seeing this over the last several years? I'm talking about mega church pastors. I'm talking about people that were in high esteem. I'm talking about people that have a great influence over our world and our nation are falling to sexual immorality. Some some kind of sin is becoming prevalent. The scripture talks about this, that, that the Lord always cleanses his church first. Always. It's always, it's a purification. It's what's happening. And it's, it's, coming, it's happening to leaders. But listen, I'm not just talking about preachers and pastors. If you're a parent in this room, if you're a father in this room, if you're a young man who is going to be a husband one day, this is for you also. You are a leader in your home. And, and you've been entrusted with a spouse and entrusted with children. And let me just remind you, those children that you think are only yours, they were God's before they were yours. God is, has tempt loan his kids to you. You're babysitting God's kids is what's happening. And we will give an account one day for our children and for our families and our leadership. This is a big, big deal to the Lord, but it's a big deal to getting this right and turning the tide on this. Church leaders. Man, listen to this. Uh, Matthew 23, 13. Jesus speaking to the church leaders of his day. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees. He calls them hypocrites. He says, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves and you don't let others enter either. Let me read that again. You won't go in for yourselves and you don't let others enter either. There is something to be said about the the burden of responsibility that we have as leaders. And it's this. It's that where the leader goes, the people follow. If we don't go to a certain place in the Lord, the people don't go. We we hinder them. This This is just how it works. And it will always be that way. You know, usually when, uh, when a young man is coming to me, getting, you know, he's preparing himself for marriage, one of the many things I'll, I'll tell him is, bro, if you're not given to the Lord, like if the Lord doesn't have your heart, you're not fit to lead your wife. That's just real. You're not fit to lead your wife or a family if you're not following Jesus. Because where, where are they going to follow you to? If you're not following him, they can't follow you. But here's the thing. They will follow you somewhere. But if you're not going to Jesus, that means you're leading them somewhere else. It's that We go back to that value system in your home I was talking to you about. You want to lead well? You have to follow well. And your leadership is predicated on the person you're following. That's why Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Look, church, I could talk to you about this at length because I don't know where my wife is. I think she's she here. She in the kids' classroom. She's in class. Of course she is. Um, she'll tell you this. For the, for the first seven years of our marriage, we were failing miserably because I wasn't serving the Lord. I wasn't following Jesus, period. I was following my own plan, my own ways, my own rules. And our ship was sinking fast. And after I, I met Jesus and I gave my life to him and began to follow him, I noticed something, something shifted in my household. And I noticed the more I dr- got closer to the Lord, the more I drew near to him, the more my wife started to draw near to him. This may not mean anything to you, but I specifically remember for those seven years, I tried to change my wife and she was trying to change me. With no avail, like no effort, like 
we were gaining no ground. And I don't know if it's working for you in your marriage either. Like when you're trying to change somebody, good, good luck with that. I feel like we got further and further away the more we tried to change. So here's what happened. I give my life to the Lord and stop trying to fix her. And all of a sudden, the Lord was doing a work because I was following him. And it's just been beautiful ever since. It still requires work. It still requires effort. But I, but I have to follow him in this way. I digress. Here we go. Let me give you one more. Matthew 18, 6. This is still on comp- compromised leaders. This is just to put a little sting on it. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble and sin by leading them away from my teaching, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. Sheesh. That's leadership, folks. There's a cost for this. God takes it serious. He says, if you cause one of my little ones who believes in me to stumble and sin and they fall away from me, it would be better if we put a big rock around your neck and threw you in the ocean. Other scriptures say it'd be better if you weren't even born. That's pretty heavy, huh? Okay, well, I'll get off that. We've compromised the word, the doctrine, scripture. We've compromised the value system of the kingdom, and we've compromised our leadership. These are the things that are fighting against a people being consecrated to God. Okay, so now let's just get to the three significant truths regarding consecration. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. Before I do, fun fact, that most revivals that we've seen in our nation... Uh, And revival is simply when uh, it's like an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where where there's like a deadness in spirituality. We talked about that moral decline, that spiritual decline. Most revivals happen in the midst of spiritual decline and, and moral decline. It happens in the midst of it. Like when the things are the darkest is when revivals break out, when reformation begins to happen like an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it happens in these really chaotic cultures. You you know what? This is why I got excited about today's message. I feel like we're in that culture right now. This is where we are. So I'm like, Lord, you are up to something. You're doing something. I'm stirred about this. I'm excited. When culture fails, God always breathes life through revival, through his Holy Spirit. And it always happens with a person first. Before a household gets saved, a person gets saved. A father gets saved. A mother gets saved. Before your workplace gets saved, like it's, it's going to happen to an employee. Before a, a community or a city is saved, it happens to a family. It happens to a church. It begins to spread. This is what it looks like. Everyone say set apart. Say consecrated. Here we go. Three truths regarding consecration. We are not consecrated to a thing or to a church. We're consecrated to a person, and his name is Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us from ev- with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Stop right there. Even before he made the world, before God pressed play on humanity, he wanted a people. He loved you and he chose you in Christ to be what? Holy and without fault in his eyes. This is consecrated. This is set apart. That's what it means to be set apart for holy use. This was God's plan from the beginning. It's always been his plan. Verse five, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through 
Jesus Christ. We are consecrated to a person. First and foremost, we are set apart for Jesus. Before you have an assignment, before you get busy working for him, you're set apart for him. Just like we did this morning. Put the prayer list away. Everything else stops. We're here for Jesus. I'm made for him. I was designed for him. This was God's plan from the beginning. Verse 5 again. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him what? Great pleasure. When you think of yourself in relationship to God, I want you to always remember this, that you bring him great pleasure. This is, this is huge. We are consecrated to a person. Let me give you one more scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. He, he just finished giving them a list of things, uh, sinful acts, and he says this, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. Once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior, those are your kingdom values, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world." Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 11 probably gives the best depiction of what it means to be a set-apart people for the Lord. It, it gives all the reasons right there. We are consecrated to a person, Jesus, for the benefit of other people. Yes, you are consecrated to him first because he wants you as his own possession. But he puts you in this earth around your neighbor's so that you can be a benefit to them. And all of your actions and all of your deeds point to the one who sent you. Everyone say set apart. Set apart. Say consecrated. consecrated. This is God's plan. This is what it is. Now I'm going to put a little twist on this. Um, because yes, you are consecrated to a person... And, and I want to be careful because I don't want it to sound like God just has like all these tasks and these, this work for you to do, right? Like he's an employer, you're an employee, and he's ready to fire you if you get it wrong. Uh, let me just say this. Look, church, it matters how you think about your own, uh, like your character in this, in this story. It's important how you, how you frame your thoughts in this narrative. It really does matter. You're more than a servant. You're more than a worker. You're more than God's hands and feet. To be consecrated to him, to be set apart for him in the biblical context has, has more to do with being married to him, like a wedding ceremony. Oh, this is different now. Like husband and wife. Don't take this to a weird place, but there's such a union that is very similar to the husband and wife in Scripture. And this is really what it means to be set apart for him. Uh, guys, put up Revelation 19.7, just to kind of get here quickly. This is how the whole story ends for us. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has what? What has she done? She's consecrated herself. She's set herself apart. She's made herself ready. The bride did that. Who's the bride? You are. The church is. Jesus is returning for his bride. 
When he calls you and sets you apart, he's saying, you're mine and I'm yours. And I'm going to join myself with you to the degree that you're going to look more and more like me. You're going to resemble me. You're going to have my heart. So this is more than God giving you a task. This is him giving you his heart and you have his. And now you do, you do these tasks out of love and you do them out of joy. And so you're, you consecrate yourself. You set yourself apart for him, not as a task or as a duty, but out of love. Uh, men, we don't really do this. Women, y'all do this. Before your wedding day, uh, do you binge on ice cream before, like two weeks before the wedding? Do you just eat donuts at a whim at the office two weeks before the wedding? No? Oh, you don't? Why? What, what are we preparing for? The wedding day, right? You're like, don't give me that donut. Girl, I got to fit in a dress in two weeks. What are you talking about? I'm getting myself ready. I got to get ready. This is what it looks like. To consecrate yourself to the Lord, to set yourself apart is I'm preparing for his return. He's coming back. He's coming back. And the bride has made herself ready. This is the framework that we think about this. Because most people, they preach this stuff and it's just like, it feels like duties and tasks and responsibilities. It's like, man, that just seems hard. This Christian life is hard. It means I can't have any fun. You're seeing this through the wrong lens. Being consecrated and set apart is not that at all. This is done out of love. He gave everything for me. That's why you cannot understand real consecration apart from the finished work of the cross. Here's why. Because you have to understand that consecration denotes high value or a price paid. And the price for you was all of God. And the price for God is all of you. That's consecration. So we put that in a different context. So, number one, uh, we have been consecrated to a person. Everyone say to a person. I got to move through these quick. The second one is you've been consecrated for a purpose. Everyone say a purpose. This is huge. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verse 20 says, In a wealthy home, some utensils are made out of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones for everyday use. Verse 21. If you keep yourself pure, that is set apart, that is consecrated. If you keep yourself pure, here's what happens. You will be a special utensil for honorable use, and your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. You have been set apart for a person, but you have been set apart for a purpose. So when you see this correctly, and now you begin to give your life to the Lord and set your life apart in such a way, the Lord begins to purify you, and the Lord begins to prepare you for good works. Now, this is exciting. This is what you signed up for. This is what your recruiter told you about. This is the adventure part he was selling you in his office. This part right here. What would happen to my life, to your life, if we actually set ourselves apart for the Lord and the Lord actually used you in a way that you couldn't even dream possible? He wants to do this. He sent his son to the cross for this purpose before the foundation of the world to have a people set apart, a possession of his own. Whew. I don't know about you, man. I do want this. Do you want this? Yes, you do. For a purpose. Mm, moving on. Oh, man. Maybe not yet. So let me... Gosh. So, so I remember when I, when I first got saved, I was serving in the Marines, and I, I gave my life to the Lord, and he was so real to me. Um, I, didn't feel any of, I didn't feel like I had to do any of this out of obligation. I wanted to pray. I wanted to read my Bible. I wanted to get to know him. 
and all the byproduct in my life, me, you know, when I would share Jesus with someone, I didn't feel like that was like a duty or responsibility. I wanted everyone to know about this Jesus I met. I want you to be free like I'm free. I wanted that. And so I was doing that in, in, just, in my own very naive, very early stage, very clumsy way. I was doing that. Um, no training, no nothing. And then, and I stayed faithful to that. This is, this is me setting myself apart for the Lord. Here's what I'm saying. This didn't take years of time. The Lord began to use me for works immediately. And I could probably spend the next two hours talking to you about moments where God would send me to someone and it would be powerful, life-changing. And it was all, ha- and I'm in uniform doing this stuff, doing all of this on active duty in the Marines. And I'm saying the more I did that, here it is. I said all of that to say this. The more I was faithful with the little that he had given me, he began to give me more. And he began to like expand my territory, give me more influence. The reason why we're here doing this today is a result of me being faithful with where I was. I'm saying it's the same with you. You don't have to wait till you're some mature, fully grown, you know, I've read the Bible 10 times and have a good theology, and now I can start being used. No, he wants to use you right now, right now. And to the degree that you will be faithful with yourself unto the Lord, set apart to the Lord, he will give you more. He he gives you more responsibility, more influence, greater resources. This is how it works. So I guess what I'm saying is, is, is we don't graduate from consecration. Consecration wasn't like one thing I did when I first got saved, and now 20 years later, I don't consecrate anymore. No, I'm still giving myself to the Lord. I still do this. This is more real today than it ever has been. Last one. What was the first one again? You've been consecrated to what? A person. You've been consecrated for a purpose. And the third one is you've been consecrated for his power. Everyone say power. Watch this. Luke chapter 4, verse 2. This is Jesus after his water baptism. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Jesus gets baptized, the heavens open, God speaks and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came and descended on him and remained. And shortly thereafter, the Spirit of God sent Jesus into a wilderness. Everyone say consecration. Jesus was getting set apart. It was a time of testing. It was a time of purification. Jesus goes into the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes into the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. But watch how he comes out. Luke 4, verse 14. This is just 12 verses later. Jesus returned to Galilee. How? Oh, come on now. In the power of the Spirit. And the good news about him spread everywhere to the whole countryside. And he was teaching in their synagogues. And everyone praised him. Oof, we cooking today. Okay, so John G. Lake said it like this, that Jesus goes into the wilderness with the Holy Spirit, but he comes out of the wilderness with the Holy Spirit having him. Jesus has the Holy Spirit when he goes into that testing period, that set apart time, that time of consecration. But he comes out of that time and testing with the Holy Spirit having all of Jesus. And can I submit to you that this is when Jesus' ministry began. There were no miracles. There was no water into wine, no deaf ears open, blind eyes dead raising prior to this. After the time Jesus was set apart, filled with the Holy Spirit, and now he's walking in the power of the Spirit, this is when miracles began in his life. Everyone say set apart. You've been set apart for a person. For the benefit of other people, you've been set apart for a purpose, and you've been set apart for his power. This is just the way it is. 
And the more you'll be faithful with that, the more he will give you of himself. Is this exciting? Okay. Let's land. I want to be really, really clear about something. I am not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that if you begin to fast for three days or 40 days like Jesus, if you begin to, you know, if you say, I'm going to pray every day for the next 30 days, I am not suggesting to you that if you do these things, that your efforts will bring power upon you. That probably sounds like a contradiction of what I, the first thing I told you. Your efforts don't bring you power. If they did, we would be able to brag and say, look what we did. This is always a work of the Spirit. When I'm saying consecrate yourself, set yourself apart for the Lord, we're doing it in recognition that He already made the way available by the cross. When He died my death, I rose with Him in that, from that grave, from my old nature, because of His Spirit, Right? And I am now a new creation in Christ Jesus. His spirit now lives in me. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. There are still things in us, in our mind, and in our hearts that we have not given up to the Lord. That whole list of things I was telling you about that hinders consecration from happening, sexual immorality, all these worldly thoughts, the ways of the world, that's still there. Yes, you may have given your life to the Lord, but there's still a process that you need to go through where the Lord can extract all of those things out of you. Does this make sense? So I'm not suggesting that we go and fast and pray and we set ourselves apart for the Lord so that it's a magic formula and now all of a sudden you're super Christian walking in power. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that if you fast and pray and set yourself apart for the Lord, I am not saying that you get more of God. I am saying that if you set yourself apart for him and you allow him to purify you and reveal those things that are hidden in you and you lay them at his feet, you don't get more of him. He gets more of you. That's what's happening. He gets more of you. Because look, the moment you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you get all of God in you. It, this isn't some layaway plan where he gives you, you know, a percentage of himself. And then if you behave, he gives you more of himself. You have all of him on the first day. The question is, does he have all of you on the first day? So when we set apart and we consecrate ourselves and we go through this trial and these moments where the Lord is sifting through our heart and our anxious cares and our worries and our fears and all the things that we're, that we're not letting him in, that's, that's what this is about. That's what that 40 days was about for Jesus. He was being purified. He was being tested. Not as punishment, as preparation. This is what being set apart does. He's preparing you. He's purifying you. He's purging you. He's getting things out of you. But he's equipping you and he's calling you. And I'm telling you, every great man and woman of God in the Bible and every great man and woman of God on earth that has done mighty exploits for the Lord has been one that has been set apart and consecrated for God. Every single time. Every single time. Several years ago, and, and this is my last story. Several years ago, I felt the Lord. Um, I really felt the Lord prompting me to, to come away with him. Uh, I, have, I don't have the time to get into this story, but man, I could not. I, I couldn't settle. I couldn't rest. Uh, he was pursuing me for probably three days. I, I felt it the moment I woke up. I feel it even before I went to bed. I felt like the, the spirit of the Lord was saying, come away with me. Just, just withdraw with me. Just drop everything and just be with me. 
and I couldn't find the time. Uh, it, I mean, there were just, just the busyness of the schedule. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I had all the excuses. Finally, I think I finally got to a point where I told Vicki, I said, babe, I, I have to do this. I, I, I have to do this. Help me to free my schedule. So, I mean, we, we were calling people. Hey, can you pick the kids up from school? You know, all this stuff. We're, we're fi- figuring it all out because I'm going to go lock myself away for about three days. And that's what I was feeling in my heart. So we did. Vicki booked me a room somewhere in the middle of nowhere, literally. And I went by myself and I locked myself in this room. And what's, it was amazing because uh, it was actually kind of in the mountains uh, in Northern California. And there was a beautiful panoramic view in the window when I got to this room. And I even felt the Lord tell me, close the curtains. I don't want you looking at anything but me for the next three days. Like, I don't want any distractions out of you. So I closed the curtain. I did not leave that room for three days. It was a three-day water fast only. Water and the Bible. I took no technology with me. Only my phone with explicit instructions not to call unless the house was on fire or, you know, someone was having a baby and no one was pregnant. So it's like, okay. And I'm telling you, man, like it was three days shut up in a room, and I've never experienced anything like this before or after. Um, but it was as if, it was as if there was a war raging on the inside of me during this three days. I know some of you thought, oh man, it must have just been glorious to be with the Lord for three days. No, hell showed up for three days is what happened in my heart. Every temptation known to man was magnified during those three days. I, I can't even begin to tell you the thoughts, the images, the temptation, the desires that were coming up out of me. It was wild. Um, if, if we did a, a you know, if we, if we set up a video camera in that room and we did a time lapse and we, we met those three days, you know, if we did it like in five minutes, I would look like a crazy man in there. I was standing, kneeling, sitting, twirling, walking, pacing, laying down, reading my Bible, praying on my back, on my face, on my feet, like it for the whole three days. Like there was such a restlessness. Here's what was happening. The Lord was revealing to me during that time of every single thing I had not surrendered to him. This is what was happening. It was a time of purification. It was a time of getting free. I didn't even feel like anything super spiritual during that three days. I I didn't hear a phrase from the Lord. I didn't hear a sentence. Honestly, I left that room after three days feeling like it was a complete waste of my time. And we only rented it for three days. And so my three days were up and I drove home and I broke my fast and... It didn't hit me until I got home. And in the the days to come and in the weeks to come, the first thing I noticed was my heart was so tender to the Lord. I, I would hear a song on the radio and it would remind me of my time spent with Jesus in that room. And I'd pull the car over and weep uncontrollably, like heartbroken for him, like lovesick for him. That went on for weeks. My heart was so tender. The other thing that happened was I was at a grocery store and I was just getting groceries. Like, you know, my wife said, hey, we need this, this, and this. And I was in the frozen section and a lady came up next to me to get something from the frozen section. I didn't say a word to her. I didn't look at her. She just, I just walked up next to her. And as I did, uh, like she manifested a demonic spirit in the grocery store. Now, if you've never seen any of that happen like, like that, I had never seen anything like that happen up till that point. It, it scared me. I didn't put on my cape and my super suit and cast the demon out. Like it, I grabbed my frozen chicken and walked out of there. Like I was scared. Like what just happened? Here's what happened. That time that I set apart with the Lord... Even though I didn't feel like anything was happening, the Lord had so saturated me with his presence 
that everywhere I would go, like people would sense the Lord on me. Um, and in that case, this lady like manifested a demonic spirit right in the grocery store. Again, I've never had anything like that happen since or before. But I'm telling you, there is something very real about being set apart for the Lord. Now, I have to be very careful not to like try to manufacture that again. I just know what I'm telling you is real. And I just know that what I'm telling you is biblical. And God so desires a people, a possession for himself to be set apart as holy and blameless. And he doesn't want to separate you from the world. He wants you right here in the midst of it so that other people can see him through you. This is what he wants. And this is what he paid for at the cross. I'm gonna ask you just to close your eyes as I begin to pray. Mike, you can grab your microphone and get ready. And I don't know what the Lord is, is doing to you or saying to you even as I'm, I'm sharing this. I, I pray that he's doing something. I pray that he's just rearranging your furniture and just moving stuff around. But I think for some of you, there may be some of you that, that, that maybe you've been dabbling in some things that aren't of God. And maybe you've been going to other sources other than him for truth, whether that be a medium or whatever, a card reader. And the Lord's dealing with you about that. You can be free from that. You just surrender that to him. You repent. You lay that down. For others of you, it's bitterness in relationships. Maybe there's some unforgiveness that's lurking in your heart. I'm telling you, Jesus paid too high a price for you to hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness. And, and the way to set yourself apart is to lay that down and to, and to forgive as freely as he has forgiven you. Maybe for others, you're putting your trust in money. And maybe greed is the thing that's, that's really holding you back from the Lord. You know, the Bible talks about this spirit of, of mammon. And if you don't know what the spirit of mammon it, it is, it's, it's simply when you call money your master and not God. That's what he says. He says you can't serve two masters. But it's also this. It's also, it's also when we seek Abundance without dependence on the Lord. We will always be dependent upon the Lord. We will never, we should never try to be at this place where we have everything and we don't need him. That's what the spirit of mammon does. For others of you, it's worry and it's anxiousness and it's fear. There's probably people here that your mind becomes plagued with thoughts of things that haven't even happened yet. We need to surrender that to him. For others, it's sexual behavior that needs purging. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit who is in you, who, who you have received from God? The Bible says you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You've been set apart. You've been purchased with a high price. You belong to him. You know, maybe for some of you, the thing that's hindering you from being set apart is maybe you, you only give God your Sunday. He gets a couple of hours on Sunday, but he doesn't get Monday through Saturday. For others, it's, it's making a commitment to read his word, to read this Bible for the first time. And not just read it, but actually do what it says. For others, it's prayer. Finding that time to devote yourself to the Lord like we did earlier today. And I think for all of us, uh, it's that having the willingness to step out and share the things of God with other people. It's huge. So Father, I just thank you that you're doing a work by your Holy Spirit, that you're revealing these things by your light. 
And I thank you for the finished work of the cross that was done on our behalf. We can lay all of these weights at your feet, all of these heavy burdens that hinder us from running the race you called us to run. God, I thank you, and I do not take it lightly that you came to this earth for a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people set apart for you, your own personal possession. God, we do not take this lightly. And I repent, Lord, for seeing myself as just a church-attending Christian. Lord, I want to be, I want to see myself as a special vessel used for everyday use. God, I need your heart. I need your love. I need your compassion. But most of all, I apply the shed blood of Jesus over me to wash me and cleanse me from all of my sins, for making me brand new. Father, I thank you that you came You sent your son to die a death that was meant for me. And you rose from the third day. And because you are risen, so am I. And we are a chosen people. And we choose to set ourselves apart for you. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you.